Good afternoon. Welcome to Brown Bell Statistics Seminar. And um, I'm Rossi Law, a faculty host for today's event. And for those of you new to our departmental seminar, uh, we, uh, the format is usually that the presentation follow after, um, followed by question, uh, question and answer session. And um, because of the size of the crowd today, we're going to also use uh, this uh, red box thing to capture your vo uh, questions and for videotaping and also uh, make sure your questions are heard. And today I'm very pleased to introduce Professor Yang Lacan. Um, Professor Lacan is a director of Facebook AI research, also known as FAIR. And he is also a civil professor of computer science, neuroscience, and electronic and computer engineering at New York University. He's also the founding director of NYU Center for Data Science. Before joining NYU, he headed a research department uh, for industry, including uh, AT&T and NEC. Professor Lacan has made extraordinary research contributions um, in machine learning, computer vision, mobile robotics, computational neuroscience. Among this, uh, he's a pioneer in developing convolutional neural networks, and he is also a founding father of convolutional nets. And this um, works contributed to, um, I say, the creation of a, a new and exploding field in machine learning called uh, deep learning, and which is now a core artificial intelligence tool for various range of uh, applications from image to natural text processing. And his research um, contributions has earned him many um, honors and awards, and including the election to the U.S. Academy, uh, U.S. National Academy of Engineering. Um, today he will give a seminar titled, How Could Machine Learn as uh, Efficiently as Animals and Humans? I understand some of you, uh, some of you actually told me they drove from Boston or uh, many places very far. So without further ado, uh, let's welcome Professor Yana Kuhn for his talk. So thank you very much, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, again, I play now, uh, occasionally when I uh, give a talk here, is I count how many former colleagues from AT&T are in the room. I count at least two, Chris, Chris Rose here, Michael Littman. Um, maybe that's it. <laughs> that's, that's, that's pretty good too. Um, right, so how could machines learn as efficiently as animals and humans? I have a terrible confession to make. AI systems today suck. <laughs> um, here, here, here it is in a slightly less uh, uh, vernacular form. Uh, recently, I, I gave a talk at a, a conference in Colombia called the Computational um, and Cognitive Neuroscience uh, Conference. It was the first edition. And there was, uh, I gave a, a keynote, and before me, uh, Josh Tannenbaum gave a keynote where he said this, all of these AI systems that we see now, none of them is real AI. And what he means by this is that none of them actually learn stuff that are as complicated as what humans can learn, but also learn stuff as efficiently as what animals seem to learn them. So we don't have robots that are nearly as agile as, as a cat, for example. Uh, you know, we have machines that can play Go better than any humans, but, uh, but that's kind of not quite the same. And so, it, you know, that, that kind of tells us there is sort of major pieces of, of learning that we haven't figured out, that, you know, animals are able to do that we, don't do, we can do with our machines. And so, you know, I'm sort of jumping ahead here and, and so, sort of, you know, telling you the punchline in advance, which is that, uh, the, you know, we need a, sort of a new paradigm for learning. Uh, or a new way of formulating perhaps old paradigms uh, that will allow machines to kind of learn how the world works the way you know, animals and humans do that. So the current paradigm of learning is basically supervised learning. So all the applications of machine learning, AI, <laughs> deep learning, all the stuff you see, the actual real world applications, most of them use supervised learning. There's a tiny number of them that use reinforcement learning. But most of them use some form of supervised learning. Um, and you know, supervised learning, we all, I'm sure most of you in the room know what it is. You, want to build a machine that classifies cars from airplanes, you show an image of a car. If the machine says car, you do nothing. If it says airplane, you adjust the knobs on the machine so that the output gets closer to the one you want. And then you show an example of an airplane, and you do the same. And then you, you know, keep showing images of airplanes and cars, millions of them, thousands of them. You adjust the knobs a little bit every time, and eventually the knobs settle on the, 
on the configuration, if you're lucky enough, that will distinguish every car from every airplane, including the ones that the machine has never seen before. That's called a generalization ability. Um, and you know, what deep learning has brought to the table there in supervised learning is uh, the ability to kind of build those machines more or less automatically with very little sort of human input in how the machine needs to be built, um, except in very general terms. So, the, the, so the, the limitation of this is that you had to have lots of data that has been labeled by, by people. And to get a machine to distinguish cars from airplanes, you need to show it thousands of examples. And it's not the case that you know, babies or animals need thousands of examples of each category to be able to recognize. Now, I should say that even with supervised learning, you can do something called transfer learning, where you train a machine to recognize lots of different objects. And then if you want to add a new object category, you can just retrain with very few samples, and generally it works. And so what that says, what it tells you is that when you train the machine, it kind of figured out a way to represent the world that is independent of the task somehow, even though you train it for a particular task. Um, so what did uh, deep learning bring to the table? Uh, deep learning brought to the table the uh, ability to basically train those machines without uh, having to handcraft too many, too many modules of it. The traditional way of doing pattern recognition is you take an image and you design a feature extractor that turns the image into kind of a list of numbers that it can be digested by a learning algorithm, you know, regardless of what your favorite learning algorithm is. Uh, linear classifiers, super vector machines, kernel machines, trees, whatever you want, or neural nets, but, uh, but you have to kind of pre-process it in a digestible way. And what deep learning has allowed us to do is basically design our learning machine as a cascade of parameterized uh, modules, each of which computes a nonlinear function parameterized by a set of coefficients, and, uh, and train the whole machine end-to-end -to, -end to do a particular task. And this is kind of a, an old idea. People, even in the 60s, had the idea that this would be great to come up with learning algorithms that would train multilayer systems of this type. But they kind of didn't quite have the right framework, if you want, neither the right computers for it. And so in the 80s, um, uh, something came up called backpropagation with neural nets that allowed us to do this. And I'm, I'm going to come to this in a minute. So the next question you can ask, of course, is what do you put in those boxes? And the simplest thing you can imagine as a nonlinear function, it has to be nonlinear because otherwise there's no point in stacking boxes. So the, the simplest thing you can imagine is, you know, take an image, think of it as a vector, essentially, multiply it by a matrix. The coefficients of this matrix are going to be learned. And you can think of every row of this matrix, uh, you know, being used to compute a dot product with the input vector. And that produces basically a weighted sum of the inputs multiplied by those coefficients. Uh, that gives you another vector, and you pass each component of this vector through a nonlinearity like this one, for example, just halfway of rectification. Right? So you have two, two, uh, two different steps. Linear, nonlinear, linear, pointwise, nonlinear. Very simple. And you can show that by stacking two layers of this, you can approximate any function you want as close as you want, as long as you have sufficiently many of these guys in the middle, you know, by tweaking the parameters of the two layers. Um, but in fact, most functions we're interested in are more economically represented by many layers. And so that's kind of the, 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 the new approach to deep learning, if you want, that changes from kind of the, the neural nets of, of uh, 30 years ago, which you know, typically had only two or three layers. Uh, the, the neural nets of today, the deep learning systems of today, have anywhere between 20, uh, 50, or 100 layers. Um, OK, so we have linear operators that are parameterized by coefficients. And the supervised learning, we're basically going to train it to minimize some sort of objective function that's going to measure the discrepancy between the output the machine produces and the, machine, and the output we want. And so the subjective function is going to be differentiable. <laughs> uh, what we're going to do is compute the gradient of the objective function with respect to all the parameters in the machine, uh, uh, averaged over a number of training samples, or if we use stochastic gradient descent, averaged over a, a small batch of training samples or even a single sample. And then take one step in the negative gradient uh, using the stochastic gradient update rule. And basically, you know, the, the, the parameters are going to kind of go down to a minimum in kind of a stochastic fashion as you, as you train more and more. So now the next step you have to do is compute the gradient of the objective function with respect to the parameters. And the way you do this is through backpropagation. I'm not going to go through this. The uh, mathematical concept on which it's, it's based is incredibly sophisticated. It's, it's called chain rule. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, some people learned this in high school. And, uh, you know, it's, it basically comes down to the fact that if you have, if you arrange parameterized functions in a graph of computation, which in this case is a very simple one, it's just a, a linear stack of, uh, of modules, um, 
but it doesn't need to be such a simple graph. It could be any kind of any graph in an interconnection by propagating signals backwards through this graph, um, basically taking the gradient of some cost function you want to minimize with respect to this red variable. And so this gradient is represented by this green variable. And multiplying it by the Jacobian of this box, you get the gradient with respect to the input of that box, right? This is chain rule. Uh, so it's this guy here. Gradient with respect to the input equals gradient with respect to the output multiplied by Jacobian. Very easy. And so you kind of propagate this backwards uh, through the graph. And the cool thing about this is that um, uh, you, know, you can do this kind of automatically by you know, having a bunch of modules of this type that have been predefined and you assemble them in a graph. And then automatically you get the, you get the gradient back. You don't have to figure out how to compute it. So that's what all of those deep learning frameworks kind of allow you to do. They're very simple to use. Uh, our favorite one is called PyTorch. And, uh, uh, and you know, there's several Jacobians for each of those boxes, one that propagates you know, to the input, others that propagate through the parameters. And that allows you to compute all the gradients the, of the uh, objective function or whatever you want to minimize with respect to all the parameters. So OK, backprop. That's an old idea. The basic idea of it actually goes back, you know, it goes back to Leibniz and Newton, obviously. But um, more recently, the people in optimal control actually have used things like this it's called the adjoint, adjoint state method or adjoint system methods for optimal control. That was invented in the 60s. Uh, that's what NASA used to compute rocket trajectories and things of that type. And uh, it wasn't used for learning. It was used for optimal control. Uh, but it's, it's a very similar idea. So think of those variables as being kind of uh, control variables of a rocket and this being kind of the trajectory of the rocket, if you want. Um, and then it, people realized you could use this for learning in the late 70s, early 80s, but never quite actually made it work. And you know, it started being used in the late 80s, essentially. And that's when the first wave of neural nets kind of, or the second wave of neural nets took off in the, you know, around 1986, 1987, where people realized you could train multilayer neural nets with this. And then it died in the 90s. The mid 90s. Okay, so the next question you can ask is, you know, those linear operators are, are nice, but uh, but you know, if my image is a long vector with millions of pixels, you know, I'm not going to multiply it by a matrix that's you know several million by several million. So you have to organize those linear operators in ways that make them practical for things like images or high-dimensional inputs. That that's where the idea of convolutional nets uh, 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 comes in. It, it actually doesn't come from uh, sort of you know theoretical hypothesis, but it was actually inspired by biology. Uh, so I know there are neuroscientists in the room. So this is inspired by Hubel and Weasel, 1962, very classical work in neuroscience. You know, Nobel Prize-winning work. Uh, there were you know models of uh, computational models of, of this those basic ideas uh, by Hubel and Weasel uh, by Fukushima in his neural neutron model uh, that was kind of inspiring for inspiration for for convolutional nets. And the basic idea is that individual cortex, and this is something you can derive also from first principles, it's probably a good idea on images to be able to detect local features by basically having a template that you match with the input, and you get a score for how well this thing matches with this one, basically a dot product, a weighted sum of those pixels by those coefficients. And then you swipe this over the image everywhere, and the results are recorded in a, something we call a feature map um, here. And that operation is a discrete convolution, but it's very similar to the kind of operation you see what's called simple cells in the visual cortex uh, 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 do on, on, uh, on, on images where uh, a particular neuron in the visual cortex is, is connected to sort of a, neuro, you know, a, a local neighborhood in the visual field and sort of det detects local features as well. So that's what this first layer is doing. So th these are multiple filters. This is a, a convolutional kernel, also called a filter, applied to this image, produces those maps. And then you do a, what's called a pooling operation where you take the result, the, like a, a local patch of those results of filtering after the nonlinearity, and you compute an average or a max or L2 norm or something like this. Um, and you subsample the results so that the windows over which you compute this uh, aggregation is step by more than one pixel. So here is step by two pixels, so you get a map that's half the resolution of this one. And then you repeat the process. So you get convolutions again. So this guy is a result of <coughs> applying convolution kernels to each of those maps adding up the result, passing it through a linearity, and then again there is pooling and subsampling. And so as you go up the layers, you get um, you know, representations that are more global and kind of more abstract and et cetera. And this is really the idea of simple cells and complex cells, complex cells being those pooling areas, sort of a you know, realization of this. That's a, a drawing from Fukushima's paper on the neurocognitron where you had those kind of simple cells and complex cells. 
<laughs> so this is a, a convolutional net. Uh, this, this is meant to be an animation. I'm not sure why it's not animating. But it's not animating. And not only that, it actually crashed my computer. <laughs> All right, I'm going to have to do something. Bear with me for just a minute. OK, now it works. Um, so this is a, uh, an old uh, convolutional net trained in the early 90s to recognize handwriting. And what you can see here is that you know, this is the, the first layer. That's the input. This is the first layer, six feature maps, then pulling subsampling, second layer, pulling subsampling, third layer. Uh, and by the time you get here, each, each unit here, each pixel represents the activation of a unit. It basically sees the entire input, or at least a, a square on the, on the input. And so a slice through this uh, represents you know, an entire character essentially in sort of an abstract form. And the cool thing we realized pretty quickly with this is that we could uh, not just use it to recognize single objects, but also multiple objects. And that's kind of very important. So here, we, we, uh, you basically have multiple copies of the same convolutional net applied to kind of sliding window over the input. And it's actually very cheap to do this. You can sort of apply the convolutional net convolutionally. It's a, you know, convolutions all the way. Uh, people sometimes call this fully convolutional net now. And, uh, and at the output, you get kind of a score for every window and every category. And here, I'm just showing the winning score with kind of a grayscale to indicate this, the the, the score of the category, and then you know, a very simple post-processing kind of pulls out the correct interpretation. And so here, the, the cool thing is that you know, the system can recognize objects without prior segmentation. You don't have to separate the, the, the digits before being able to recognize them. And that's really important if you want to be able to apply those things to natural images where objects appear in a, you know, in a background, and you can't afford to, I mean, you can't actually figure out how to separate them from the background. So that was kind of an important uh, thing. And then, you know, uh, going forward, uh, a number of years, about uh, almost you know, 10 years to uh, 2003, uh, someone at DARPA came, us, came up to us and, and said, uh, can you use machine learning neural nets, let's say, to drive robots? And so we built this little track robot here. It's just a radio control track with two cameras, analog cameras. And we uh, had this track being driven by someone for about 20 minutes, um, or you know, a total of maybe two hours. And, and that person would be uh, instructed to drive straight and sort of veer off whenever there was an obstacle. And you know, he would, uh, you know, after some training, you, know, you, you, you feed the network with two images from the two cameras, and then you would just train the network to emulate the, the steering angle of the human driver. And you let the robot loose, and it kind of you know, gets through all this kind of horrible, uh, busy New Jersey backyard here. Uh, driving itself through, this, uh, through these obstacles. So we showed this to DARPA, and they said, oh, that's great. Uh, we're going to start a program called Lagger and have six different teams compete. Um, it would be nice if uh, this slide actually showed. Here we go. Um, six different teams compete. They will all get the same, the same robot. And you'll train this robot to kind of, uh, you know, using machine learning to figure out whether it can drive over a particular area or not. And so we use this convolutional net that kind of would look at bands uh, in the image and then label every pixel as to whether it's traversable or not. So something like this. And the cool thing is that you can actually get truth, uh, more or less ground truth, through stereo vision. So using a stereo vision system, because this robot has multiple cameras, you can figure out if something sticks out of the ground. Uh, but that only works up to about 10 meters. Beyond, beyond that, it doesn't work. So you train the neural net with the labels collected from stereo, and then you run the neural net on the whole image, and it does this. It, you know, it figures out where the path is, essentially. And then it figures out here in the back, there is this row of obstacles and the little passageway uh, in between. And, and so this thing kind of uh, worked pretty well. There were, again, six different teams competing on this. Uh, we were the only ones to use commercial nets. Um, but the, you know, again, this was 2005. Project started in 2005 and ended in 2008. And so there is a fast vision system that uses stereo, a slow vision system that uses stereo, and then the you know, slow vision system as well that uses this, this neural net. And then you put the results, you combine all the results in a map, and you can do some planning to figure out you know, how to get to a particular goal. The map here is centered on the robot, uh, so it's you know, relatively uh, easy to, to plan. Um, <coughs> and then. Uh, the system actually trains itself as it goes. It, uh, it adapts, use, you know, collecting labels from the stereo vision. It, you know, it, it learns how to navigate new environments it's never seen before. 
uh, even pesky grad students who try to annoy this poor robot. <laughs> uh, the robot weighs about 100 kilos. It can probably break their legs, but they're pretty sure it's not going to do that because they actually wrote the code. This is, uh, and they trained it. This was Raya Hatzel, who at the time was a PhD student with me, who, is now, who now leads the robotics research group at uh, DeepMind, and Pierre Somanet, who is at uh, Google Brain, also working on robotics. So um, a, co a couple years later, we realized we could use the same kind of technology for not just uh, labeling pixels in an image as to whether it's traversable or not, but also label with categories. And some data sets started to appear that allowed us to train, you know, maybe with a couple thousand images, that allowed us to train a convolutional net to do this. So again, this is a convolutional net applied to the whole image. Uh, each output of the convolutional net is influenced by uh, a window on the input, which is, um, you know, something like 40 by 40 pixel at high resolution and 90 by 90 pixel at half resolution and uh, 180 by 180 pixels at, at kind of quarter resolution. So it, it sees a big context to make a decision for a single pixel. Um, uh, but it kind of makes a decision for every pixel. And the cool thing about this is that we can run this in real time. So this was implemented on what's called an FPGA, which is sort of a programmable hardware. And it could run at about 20 frames per second, uh, classifying to 33 categories. Uh, and it wasn't you know, far from perfect. You know, it classified those areas here as sand or desert. And this is the middle of Manhattan. So there's no sand I'm aware of. Um, and you know, it, it worked pretty well. So we submitted a paper to CVPR in 2011, and it was soundly rejected. Um, and the, uh, the reviewer comments were um, either what the hell is a convolutional net, or uh, how is it possible that you get so good results with a technique we've never heard of? <laughs> um, so it's kind of funny. So we. Afterwards, submitted it to ACML, which where it was accepted. Uh, and so the funny thing is, you know, back in 2011, you couldn't get a paper accepted at a computer vision conference if you use neural nets. Now you cannot get a paper accepted at CVPR unless you actually use convolutional nets. <laughs> so uh, there's complete revolution over, you know, over the next few years. Now, so that gave some ideas to a few people working on self-driving cars around that time, around 2013-14. Uh, where they realized they could use those kind of uh, convolutional net based uh, um, semantic segmentation techniques uh, to uh, you know, label every pixel in an image as to whether it's traversable or not, or as to whether it's a pedestrian or a road or something like this. So this is some work at NVIDIA. This is work at Mobileye, which now belongs to Intel. And this is a system that's, that uh, uh, you know, Mobileye produced a system that, are used, that were used in the Tesla cars for, for autonomous driving until uh, mid-2016. Then the two companies that divorced they weren't you know, agreeing with each other somehow. Um, so now um, Tesla is developing his own system. NVIDIA has a big project on this, which I may come back to. And then um, around 2012, a big revolution occurred. And what that was is the use of very large convolutional nets implemented on GPUs um, so to run really efficiently and train on large data sets like the ImageNet data set that has a million training samples, a thousand categories. And it turns out those things work really, really well when you have lots of categories and lots of training samples and when you make them big. And so the, the first to really make an infer, you know, uh, efficient implementation of those, those networks on GPUs were uh, uh, Jeff Hinton and his uh, students, Alex Krzyzewski and Ilya Sutskever. And they, uh, uh, had a, uh, they presented the result at the ImageNet workshop at ECCV in uh, uh, fall 2012 and then had a paper at NIPS in uh, uh, winter 2012. And that basically made the computer vision field completely change and basically kind of jump-started the, the deep learning revolution. That revolution had started in speech recognition a couple of years earlier. Um, and the interesting thing about this is that you know, we ended up seeing an inflation in the number of layers that are used by those, those convolutional nets. So, this is the VGG network, which was one of the top performing in 2013. And uh, Google Net, no, this was 2014, uh, yeah, 13. Then Google Net 2014, which had even more layers. And then ResNet, uh, coming here and his collaborators from Microsoft Research Asia had this idea of having skipping connections that basically uh, solve for the problem that, you know, sometimes when you train a very deep neural net, some of the layers die. I mean, they kind of, the weights kind of don't go anywhere. And uh, that kind of kills the entire thing. So they, they, they use those skipping connections to kind of prevent the you know, catastrophic uh, bad things uh, uh, happening if some layers died. And that turned out to be uh, 
a very, very good idea that seems incredibly inefficient, but in fact, it works really, really well. And so you can train neural nets with 50 layers, 100 layers, 150 layers, and they work really well. Uh, there's sort of you know, more modern versions of this, uh, one version called DenseNet, which is a collaboration between people at FAIR and uh, people at Cornell, uh, which is sort of a, a version of this that is designed to run efficiently and et cetera. And so one question you might ask is, you know, why do you need all those layers, right? I mean, theoretically, you can approximate any function with only two layers. Why do you need many layers? And you know, one possibility is the fact that the, you know, the world is, is compositional. Images are basically composed of pixels, and pixels kind of form together, you know, arrange together to form things like edges and color blobs and stuff like that. And then by detecting combinations of those, you can detect things like circles and corners and gratings and and then you know combination of those form parts of objects and combination of those objects, et cetera. So there is this kind of hierarchical nature of uh, the perceptual world, which is sort of captured by those kind of layered architectures. Um, so it used to train, it used to take um, weeks to train those, those those networks, and and now we can train one of those networks with basically state-of-the-art performance in about in about an hour on a very large machine with 256 GPU cards in it. It's actually multiple machines. Each machine has eight GPUs, and you stack them up. So you can do this kind of things if you had Facebook or Google. Um, a little more difficult in the university environment. Um, but here are some more uh, recent results on computer vision. So this is a bit of kind of a snapshot of the state of the art. Uh, this is a model called MaskRCNN, which uh, is a system that does not just semantic segmentation, but instance segmentation. So I'm not going to bore you with all the details. Uh, just going to tell you, you know, that beats all the records on some standard data set like Coco. And here is uh, an example of a result it can do. So again, it's essentially conceptually very simple, a convolutional net with some sort of uh, system that sort of detects regions of interest and then applies a, a slightly more complex convolutional net on, the, on those regions of interest. And the output of the network is not just a category, but it's a category, the coordinates of a bounding box, and an image of a mask of the object at the same resolution as the input. And so you get, for every object, you get the category, you get the mask of the person or the object, and you get a bounding box. And it detects you know, the baseball, the dog, the, pe the individual people, uh, even though they all overlap. So this is instance segmentation, not just semantic segmentation. The semantic segmentation, you would have just you know, one big blob here labeled people. Um, you can detect uh, wine glasses and wine bottles, uh, very, very important for French people. Um, you know, computers, you know, et cetera. Um, backpacks, umbrellas, sheep. You can count sheep. Um, you know, overlapping cars, you know, things like that. Uh, it works amazingly well. Um, it's also trained to uh, detect key points on uh, human bodies, so you can do the, you can infer the, the body pose of, of people in photos and videos. There's actually a demo of this which I can't show you, but it actually runs at five frames per second on a on a smartphone. Um, so it's kind of a kind of a scaled down version of this. Um, and then there are kind of new applications of this for for convolutional net uh, for three D data. So this is a recent uh, competition uh, called uh, ShapeNet, where the data set consists of 3D objects represented by point cloud from a, a depth sensor. And it's been manually segmented into, into uh, regions or parts. And the, the, the goal here is to essentially label every region with the correct uh, label. And what turned out to win this recent competition was a 3D convolutional net produced by uh, uh, Ben Graham uh, and uh, 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 um, and Lawrence van der Matten, um, so this is the original paper that describes the idea of a sparse uh, 3D convolutional net. And uh, you know, there's some uh, other contributors to the, to the system. It's a library you can download. And it's basically the idea of sort of you know, only doing convolutions in areas where you have populated voxels, because in a 3D environment, most of the voxels are empty. So you don't want to be computing convolutions everywhere where there is no nothing. And so you just follow the areas where there is something, and it turns out to be much faster and easier to train. And he actually won this competition with this technique. Um, another application of convolutional net that's more recent is a system that's actually deployed at Facebook that uses convolutional nets for, tra for translation, language translation. So you, you feed a, a sentence in, uh, in English, and it goes through a bunch of convolutions. And it's actually a gated convolutional network. So those are gated linear units, uh, which I'm not going to go into the details of. There is pointwise multiplication going on here. 
Um, and then it goes into this kind of weird alignment system that you know, basically produces uh, uh, sort of German words word by word and then kind of lines them up uh, in an appropriate way. And so it's very fast, it's very efficient, it works really well, and this is what's used for some, for translating from some pairs of languages on Facebook. Facebook can translate 2,000 pairs of languages. Uh, a number of them are translated using uh, sort of old style phrase based statistical methods. Uh, a number of them are, are translated using kind of recurrent neural nets. And then a small number of them are translated using this system, which is kind of now being trained on more and more language pairs. Um, so a lot of the, the, the research that we do at uh, FAIR, in fact, all of it is, is open. We publish everything we do, generally very quickly on archive. Uh, and uh, we also publish most of our code in open source. So these are a few examples of uh, some of the stuff we've deployed, uh, we've distributed in open source. Uh, I would kind of signal PyTorch. This is a deep learning framework with a Python front end. It's very simple to use. It's very good for research. Um, it's more transparent than TensorFlow. Um, okay, and there's of course a lot of applications of, of those things to uh, medical imaging, of course, and things like that, which you know, I'm not personally working on, but a lot of my colleagues are. Um, but what's missing about this is two things. One is uh, how do we kind of learn reasoning and, and memory and things like this? And the second one is how do we kind of learn you know, general things that animals and humans can learn without, uh, you know, without being told the name of everything or without being given uh, labeled data? So this is a work by a bunch of people from um, uh, from, from Facebook Air Research in, in, uh, in uh, Menlo Park in California. Uh, Justin Johnson was uh, an intern at, uh, at Facebook uh, from Stanford and Fefe Lee, his, uh, uh, his advisor. Um, and the idea here is, can we use uh, deep learning to do things like, like visual reasoning? So could we answer questions like this one? Is there a matte cube that has the same size as the red metal object, right? So you kind of have to kind of read this a few times and sort of figure out really what operation you have to do here. Um, and so the idea they come up with is very cool. You, you take the, the question, are there more cubes than yellow things? You feed this to a recurrent neural net that represents this as essentially a single vector fixed size. And then you run this to another recurrent net that, that spits out a, a kind of a representation of a computation graph Think of it as a, as a visual program, uh, which basically get instantiated in this graph that, that you know, has one block. Those are actually trainable blocks, okay? They're all the, the same architecture. Um, so one block that is supposed to you know, figure out, uh, like filter all the objects that are yellow, another one that fil you know, filters out the cubes, uh, one block that counts how many yellow, yellow things there are, that this one counts how many cubes there are, and then it compares the two and then you know, figures out the answer, right? And so you don't predefine what those blocks should, should do. Um, you initialize it a little bit by sort of uh, you know, heavy super, supervision by kind of specifying what the program here should be and which block should be assembled even though the blocks are not trained initially. And then you kind of back propagate the, the gradients to get the right answer through this whole thing, uh, including the conventional net. And eventually this thing figures out ex you know, what those blocks should do corresponding to each of those keywords. And, uh, and kind of learns how to do reasoning. But the interesting thing about it is that it's completely dynamical. You change the question, it's gonna change the graph, right? So the graph that you propagate gradient through changes every time. And that's why dynamic graphs are so important in deep learning nowadays. Uh, and people are so excited about it for things like natural language understanding. So dynamic graphs is, is the situation where the, the computational graph that you use to compute your answer changes when the data changes. Um, There's actually more recent work along those lines by uh, Aaron Corville at University of Montreal uh, where they don't actually have to specify a program like this. You just stack multiple blocks and it just works. It's pretty cool. Okay, so for the statisticians in the room, since I've been invited by both statisticians, um, you know, deep learning breaks all the basic rules of statistics. I mean, not all of them, but some of them, right? So the models are enormous often with many, many more parameters than there are training samples, right? I mean, so take uh, one of those uh, uh, conventional net for image net, there is one million training samples, you know, some of those models have 100 million parameters. And they still work quite well. Um, they can often nail the training set perfectly, and often there is no explicit regularization, but it still works. How's that possible? 
the loss function is very highly non-convex. It's got a ridiculously large combinatorial number of saddle points. But still, you pretty much get the same result every time you train. What it tells you is that maybe there are local minima, but they're all pretty much equivalent. And in fact, there are experiments that seem to suggest they're all connected. There's only one local minimum, basically. I mean, not one, but essentially one. Um, little attention is paid to managing, a, uh, you know, beyond using very simple things like softmax on the output when you do classification. Um, but there's a lot of effort spent on computational issues, like, you know, if efficiently implementing all those things and, and all that stuff. So um, it's, it's sort of very much you know, kind of unusual, it, it breaks a lot of the rules you see in textbooks, in, in statistical textbooks. And that might be a reason why some people who are kind of more theoretically oriented had initially a lot of kind of skepticism towards neural nets. <clears throat> okay, but let me switch to kind of the, the point I really want to make about with this talk, which is, you know, where, where do we go from there? Okay, so deep learning works really well. There's a lot of applications we can uh, uh, use it for, you know, even if we don't do uh, any research anymore, just with the technique that we've developed so far, there's probably a lot of different industries that are gonna be affected by it that we can apply this to. In fact, that's something that Andrew Ings just said recently, you know, let's stop doing research, just apply the stuff that we already know. I don't think it's a good idea, but um, I don't think he believes it completely either, but, um, but it's interesting of, of, of him to say this. Uh, so what are the obstacles, really, to kind of making significant progress? Because as I said before, all the stuff you see, that's not real AI. And our machines do not learn with the same kind of efficiency that we observe animals and humans learning with. Um, <clears throat> so how do we get machines to learn how the world works? You know, learn common sense or something like this. Um, so that, that would ask the question, you know, going back to the inspiration from biology, um, you know, does, does the brain use a learning algorithm? Or does it use 50 learning algorithms? Or maybe 200? Or maybe it's complete kludge, the result of evolution. There's no underlying principle behind it. It's just a result of, you know, millions of years of evolution. Um, how much prior structure uh, does animal or human learning require for kind of intelligence to emerge uh, in sort of a reasonable amount of time? You know, all the learning algorithms that, that you know, people in machine learning have come up with in statistics minimize some sort of objective function or optimize some sort of objective function, I should say. Uh, does the brain optimize an objective function? What would that function be? If it, if it optimizes a function, does it do it by evaluating a gradient? If it evaluates a gradient, how does it do it? You know, it probably doesn't do backprop in the way that we understand it today, but, um, and how does it un handle uh, uncertainty uh, in prediction, which I think is a crucial issue. So there's all kinds of questions like this that kind of connect um, um, you know, AI machine learning with, with neuroscience, really. And one big uh, uh, sort of missing ingredient in, uh, in AI is, uh, or, or maybe a holy grail, is the common sense, right? So there's a, a sub-area of AI called common sense reasoning. It's not actually a solution to a problem, it's more of a problem. And it's the question of how do we get machines to acquire common sense? So common sense is, you know, everyday, the common sense of everyday thing, right? That, uh, you know, supported, you know, uh, unsupported objects fall, um, that, uh, you know, some objects are stable and some, some are, are not. You know, if I let this guy go, it's gonna fall, you know, even if I put it completely vertically. So, um, you know, if I take this object, I hide it behind my, my uh, computer, you still know it's here, you know, hasn't disappeared. Um, so object permanence. So those things, you know, we, we learn. How, how do we learn the structure of the world? And one hypothesis, perhaps, is that our, our brains are prediction machines. They, they learn to predict all the missing information from whatever is available today, you know, at this time. And then time passes by, or you move your head, or whatever, and new information becomes available, and that allows you to train your world model uh, for, you know, with the new information. So. Um, you know, if I, if I want to learn uh, that the world is three-dimensional, uh, I'm gonna learn it because it's the best explanation for how the world changes when I move my head. My view of the world changes when I move my head side to side. And the best explanation for how it changes is the notion of depth. So necessarily, if my brain is trained to predict what the world is gonna look like when I move my head, it's going to have to somehow represent the notion of depth. Um, you know, same way if I want to predict uh, you know, if, if I uh, let this go, 
and I stop the movie right there, right? And I ask the machine, you know, I ask my brain, you know, predict what's going to happen next. It's going to predict, you know, this guy is going to fall on the, he's going to fall down, of course, because of gravity. Um, so it just needs to wait for time to pass by to kind of train itself to see if its prediction was correct. So that, that would be predictive learning. But predict predicting, uh, you know, learning to predict is not just predicting the, the future from the present and the past. It might be also, you know, predicting what the blind spot of your retina contains, uh, you know, without even looking, right? So if you fixate a particular place, there is a particular spot in your, in your visual field where you're essentially blind because that's where you're your optical nerve punches through your retina. You don't see anything out there, but you don't, you're not, you don't realize it because your brain kind of fills it up, essentially. Um, so things like, you know, filling the visual field at the original blind spot, filling occluded images, missing segments in speech, predicting the state of the world from partial textual description, uh, predicting the consequences of your action, predicting sequence of action leading to a result. I mean, all of those are kind of filling the blanks, if you want. And common sense, I would surmise, is the ability to fill in the blanks uh, through the construction of world models. So, you know, object permanence is something babies learn around the age of two or three months. Uh, and, you know, which is why peekaboo is so funny for little babies, because you kind of disappear when you hide your face. Um, so here's the baby orangutan here. He's been shown a magic trick. The guy, this guy put an object in a cup and then he shakes the cup. It takes the object out without showing the orangutan, then shows the inside of the cup, and the cup is empty, and the orangutan rolls on the floor laughing. <laughs> okay? That obviously broke his world model that objects, there's object permanence, right? Objects don't disappear like that. Uh, and, you know, one of three things can happen when your world model is is broken. You laugh. It's really funny. Um, it's really interesting. You pay attention because your world model is wrong, so you need to learn a new world model, basically, because of this new data that you predicted wrongly. Or something really dangerous might happen that you didn't predict, and so you're, you're scared. Right? So that's what happens when your, your world model is broken. Um, so, you know, I think how do we do this with machines? How do we get them to learn, you know, all those things about the world? You know, learn gravity. So if you show a baby, this is a bunch of slides uh, I borrowed from Emmanuel Dupoux, who is a cognitive uh, a scientist, developmental uh, cognitive scientist in Paris at Economie Supérieure. And if you do an experiment like this, you take this little car here and you put it on this support and you push it and it goes off and it doesn't fall. Of course, it's held in the back, but the baby can, you know, doesn't see that. Um, you know, before six months, babies say, yeah, sure, that's the way the world works, fine, no problem. After eight months, they go like this. You know, they open their eyes and they fixate and they say, like, what's going on? And they don't say what's going on, obviously, because they can't talk, but, you know, they look like they're saying what's going on. Um, and so with this kind of technique, by basically measuring how long, you know, babies kind of fixate and observe and open their eyes like crazy, you can figure out at what stage babies kind of learn things. And again, this is from Emmanuel Dupoux. So things like uh, object permanence you learn pretty quickly. Biological motion, the fact that there are objects that move by themselves, others that are inanimate, you know, you learn that by three months. Uh, objects that are rigid or not. Um, different types of sort of natural categories, you know, chairs, tables, cars, etc. Stability and support, and sort of basic intuitive physics, gravity, inertia, conservation of momentum. That, are, that arrives around eight months, roughly, you know, between six and eight months. And, you know, there's, you know, a bunch of other things like that um, uh, that happen at various stages. And this is not learned in supervised mode. It's not like, you know, Babies are told the, the name of objects. It's not like they are directed in any way for any of this. They basically learn this by observation. They're really not well developed in, in sort of motor control either. So they don't get to do a huge amount of interaction with the world. And so there's no way this can be learned through interaction by you know, some sort of direct reinforcement learning. Um, there's you know, other mechanism going on there where you learn how the world works by observation. And that's the piece we're missing in uh, our current machine learning and AI systems. 
So in fact, uh, I need to apologize in advance to Michael, but you know he knows what I'm going to show. So uh, um, you know, there's three sort of paradigms of learning, right? There is uh, reinforcement learning, where basically the machine at each trial is given a scalar value to tell to tell it whether it did well enough or, or not, right? So that works great for games. Machine does an action and you know it either gets a reward or not, or sometimes it has to make a, a whole sequence of action before it gets a reward. Um, and it's, it works great when it's combined with deep learning. The problem is that it requires a huge amount of training samples, an enormous amount of training samples. It's because the amount of information you give to the machine is extremely small at every trial. It's very weak. It's a, a small amount of information. Therefore, you need to do this many, many times for you to learn anything complicated. Um, supervised learning, you need a little less samples because you know you give more information every time you give it the correct answer and so if there are a thousand categories that's more than just you know a single scalar value and so you need a little fewer samples to learn you know similarly complex tasks and then the predictive learning on supervised learning you know you ask the machine to predict basically every variable from every future variable from every present variable or past variables or every un unseen variable from every seen variable right and so there is a lot more information you ask the machine to predict, and that's why probably it can learn a lot more about the structure of the world this way. So that led me to this uh, completely obnoxious slide, which I have to show in every slide now, in every talk now, uh, the analogy between intelligence and the uh, chocolate cake, where the genoise of the cake is basically unsupervised or uh, predictive learning, because that's where the bulk of the information goes. The bulk of the information given to the machine is, um, is really in that mode of learning, and then you know, the icing on the cake is supervised learning. There is considerably less information provided to the machine uh, per trial uh, in supervised mode. And in reinforcement mode, um, there's very little information uh, given to the machine. So that's going to be equivalent to the cherry on the cake. And I've been showing this. The first time I showed this slide was actually giving a talk at DeepMind, where DeepMind is actually the temple of re reinforcement learning. Um, and so it was sort of you know, obnoxious on purpose a little bit. But, um, uh, but now I kind of, you know, fell into that obsession of kind of showing it in every talk. So. so, you know, the problem with reinforcement learning, with pure reinforcement learning, and, you know, Michael will correct me if I'm wrong, um, is that, you know, if you use it in its purest form, uh, you know, you need so many trials for, to learn any kind of complex behavior that if you were to train a self-driving car to, to drive, and to learn to not run off a cliff, it would have to run off a cliff about 50,000 times before it figures out it's a bad idea, and then another 50,000 times before it figures out how not to run off a cliff. And, um, and you know, it's half of a, a joke, it, so, which is why, I mean, that's the reason why it works really well for games, because you can run games very quickly on many computers at the same time, and, you know, at many thousands of frames per second, but it doesn't really work in the real world, because you cannot run the real world faster than real time. It's kind of a thing that sucks about the world. <laughs> and then anything you do in the real world can kill you, like running off cliffs. Maybe it's a good thing that we can't run the real world fast in the real time. So perhaps what we need is build models of the world that we can run faster in the real time and that we can run without the risk of killing ourselves. And that would be predictive models. If we have a way to predict before we run off a cliff that we're going to run off a cliff, we would not run off a cliff, right? And perhaps that's the way we learn to drive. We know not to get off the road because we know bad things will happen if, that, if, that, if that's the case. Um, so, you know, reinforcement learning works really well for games and there is, you know, smashing demonstration of, of how well this works for Atari games and Go and uh, Doom and, you know, not yet StarCraft that's very much work in progress at FAIR and DeepMind and various other places. Uh, it's very complicated, but, you know, it works really well. And the latest, uh, you know, AlphaGo Zero is, is pretty amazing in that way. But again, it's a particularly simple situation where the number of actions is discrete, the world is completely observable, uh, and the, the reward is fairly clear, and you can run the environment, which is a Go board, at thousands, tens of thousands of frames per second, essentially. Um, it works pretty well even for, for games like, uh, like Doom. So this is a, a Doom competition that was won by the team from Facebook, uh, and uh, actually teams, teams from, with Facebook people kind of won two years in a row. 
16 and 17, using basically deep reinforcement learning techniques. Uh, so we work on reinforcement learning at Facebook. It's not, you know, the, the cake I showed, you know, I showed the cake, but you have to notice that this is a, a black forest chocolate cake and the uh, cherry is not optional on this cake. In fact, it's got little bits of cherries all around here inside. So. <laughs> Okay, so as I, as I said, we also work on StackCraft. So StackCraft is an extremely challenging uh, uh, situation because there is multiple time scales, there is continuous actions. Uh, it's not fully observable. You, don't, you, don't, you can't tell what your opponent is doing unless you send Scout to kind of look at it. So it's very complicated in that, in, that, in that sense. We've done a little bit of reinforcement learning for sort of local micromanagement of tactics. Um, there's actually an open source platform called ELM or Mini RTS uh, from Facebook that is basically a StarCraft like, -like uh, real time strategy game. But here is a, here's a suggestion. So I, I said, you know, we need our machines to be able to learn predictive models of the world. And this idea is very old. It goes back to, you know, very old time, but in particular to uh, one of Rich Sutton's uh, papers where he was uh, proposing uh, what he called the Dyna architecture. And he said the main idea of Dyna is the old common sense idea that planning is trying things in your head using an internal model of the world. And this suggests the existence of a more primitive process for trying things not in your head, but through direct interaction with the world. And so he said here, reinforcement learning is the name we use for this more primitive and direct kind of trying. And Dyna is the extension of reinforcement learning to include a learned world model. Now, in fact, this nomenclature doesn't exist today. All of this is called reinforcement learning. It's just that the version that has a model is called model-based reinforcement learning, and the other one is called model-free reinforcement learning. But it's basically the same, uh, the same thing. And you know, this idea that you should have a world model uh, which in optimal control is called a plant simulator, but it's the same thing, or a plant model. But this idea that you should have a predictive world model to be able to uh, kind of reason about what to do, what action to take, is a really all idea in the context of uh, of uh, optimal control. So a typical situation in optimal control, and you can look at sort of classical textbooks, you know, going back to the 60s, is you have a model of the world that gives you the state of the world at time t plus one as a function of the state of time t and the action you take. Um, and then the state of the world is sent to an objective function that kind of measures how well the state of the world is, uh, you know, how good it is. And so you can run this model of the world and through backprop through time and gradient descent, figure out a sequence of commands that will optimize this objective function over time. And if your world simulator is differentiable, you can do this through backprop and gradient descent. If it's not, you have to do, do things like dummy programming or something like this. Um, so the main problem we're going to have is how do we learn this world model? How do we learn a model that will allow a machine to predict what the state of, what the, state of the world at time t plus 1 is going to be as a function of the state at time t and our action, and perhaps actions of others in the, in the environment? And that's the problem of predictive or unsupervised learning. And that led me to state that, oops, I'm not sure how that happened. Apologies. Wow, it went forward by like 10 slides. Um, so that led me to this uh, statement that the re next revolution in AI will not be supervised. Um, I, I stole the concept of this slide from Alyosha Efros at Berkeley. Um, and, and so we have to think about what would be the architecture of a real intelligence system, a sort of an autonomous intelligence system, right? So it would be something like this, right? It would be a, an agent that, you know, produces actions on the world and the world responds with percepts. And of course the world might be, you know, the world might not care about your action at all or might, you know, care only vaguely. Um, and what the agent is trying to do the agent has an internal state which is sent to an objective function, and the objective function produces a value that basically tells the agent whether it's happy or not. So this objective function is a measure of unhappiness of that agent. You get a small value if you're happy, a large value if you're unhappy. So what the agent is trying to do is bring the world into a state that will bring itself into a mental state that basically this red function identifies as happy. And the art models of how animal brains are built are basically this way, where you know this is your entire brain except the basal ganglia, and that's the basal ganglia. So basal ganglia is the thing at the bottom of your brain that basically determines your level of happiness or comfort or discomfort or pain or things like that. 
So inside of this agent, uh, if we believe what I, all the argument I, I made previously, we, you know, the system should have some sort of world simulator that allows it to predict where the state of the world is going to be as a consequence of, of a sequence of actions. Um, and then two other modules, uh, these are sort of standard nomenclature in RL, an actor that produces action proposals that you know, can be kind of simulated in the world, and then a critic which, whose role is to predict the long-term expected value of this objective. So this guy basically computes emotions, right? So if this guy predicts that your objective function is gonna raise up, make you very unhappy or, pay, or in pain, uh, that creates fear, essentially. You, you don't wanna get anywhere near that state, and this guy kind of predicts what but that's, uh, but that's what happens. So this guy predicts this. Uh, this guy doesn't quite predict that, but this guy actually predicts that as well. And so now the problem becomes, how do we train this world simulator? Because the rest, we kind of know how to do it, more or less. We don't know how to build this. But if we knew, we could do something like this, uh, get the state of the world uh, through your perception module, initialize your world simulator, propose a sequence of actions, um, and then kind of refine the sequence of actions so as to minimize the expected uh, uh, cost computed by the critic, and then kind of train the actor to produce this optimal sequence of actions, and then take, take the first action, and then kind of shift everything by one time step. So how do we learn forward models of the world? This is an experiment that was done at Facebook a couple of years ago uh, by Adam Lehrer, Sam Gross, and Rob Fergus, where they put stack of cubes. Uh, this is in a simulator, this is in the real world. Uh, and then they observe what actually occurs, and then they train a conventional net to basically predict what's gonna happen by kind of you know, learning the mask of the objects. And what you get is you know, a pretty accurate uh, prediction for you know, this, this, this tower is gonna fall uh, this way. Um, but fairly fuzzy predictions for like tall towers where it's kind of ambiguous where things are gonna fall. So you get those kind of fuzzy predictions here. Um, and it's because you can't exactly predict you know, where things are gonna fall. Uh, so how do we solve that problem? Uh, I'm gonna skip this. So this is why predictive models are good for question answering systems and natural language processing, but I'm gonna skip this in the interest of time. Um, so, you know, here is the problem we have to deal with. Those towers can fall in a number of different directions that we can't really predict just from the look of it, which direction they're gonna fall into. So it's kind of, uh, you know, um, I don't know if I can find a, a pen here or any kind of vertical thing. I'm gonna do it with a piece of paper. So if I put this uh, piece of paper here on the table and I let it go, you can be pretty sure it's gonna fall, but you can't really tell probably which direction it's gonna fall. And every time I do it, it's probably gonna fall into, in a different direction. So you can't really use supervised learning to train something like this because if I uh, give the initial segment and then I t ask the machine predict, the, pr the machine predicts that. If that happens, that's fine. If this happens, then the machine has to predict now this. But now the next time over, it's gonna predict that. And so the best thing the machine can predict is kind of an average of the outcomes, which is not a good answer. And so it's so, something like this where, uh, let's say you, you, you observe two variables uh, which have a dependency between them. And you know, this is pretty elementary for anybody who kind of you know, works on you know, probabilistic models. But let's say these are, these are the data points you observe. Your world consists of two variables. And these are your observations. Um, if I give you a particular value of y2, you can infer basically two values for y1. But, you, but if you try to learn this with you know, L2, uh, you know, a least square criterion, you're gonna predict something right in the middle, which is not a good answer. Okay, so you have to predict, you have to somehow be able to predict one or the other, but not, not an average of the two or predict a distribution, but how do you represent distributions in high dimensional spaces? So the unsupervised learning problem is how do you capture the dependency between things like this? And one possible way is to learn a contrast function. So basically uh, think of it as an energy function or negative prob log probability if you are a probabilist. And these are the, your data points and you want those to have low energy, which means high probability, and you want everything else to have higher energy or lower probability, right? So the blue points are the data that you observe, the green points are not data, and you want the energy of the green points to, have higher, to be higher than the energy of the blue points. So if you have a parameterized function that computes this function in the space of y's, okay, it's easy enough to tweak its parameters so that when you see a blue point, you make the, the output go down, but how do you make sure the, the value of your function is higher outside of those beads? How do you generate those green points? 
and that's basically, there's basically seven or eight different methods for doing this, but I'm only gonna talk about a couple. And the first one is adversarial training. So adversarial, the basic idea of adversarial training is basically this scenario I was, I was talking about. You have uh, you know, a predictor here, and this predictor looks at the past, or let's say if you wanna do video prediction. Uh, so it looks at the past and it has access to a source of random vectors. Um, and it's gonna produce a prediction the precise prediction is going to depend on the value of this vector. And as the value of this vector changes, this uh, prediction kind of you know, goes through a, a set of plausible outputs, let's say, okay? Uh, represented by this red ribbon here. So let's say we ask the machine, we show the machine a, a small segment of video and we ask it, what is the world going to look like half a second from now? And the machine predicts this. So it predicts the pen is going to fall to the back and the left. In fact, we let time pass by, and what happens is this. The pen falls to the back and slightly to the right. So we don't, we don't want to punish the machine for making the, right decision, the, the wrong decision here because it's kind of you know, qualitatively correct. So what we'd like is we'd like a, an objective function that tells us low cost if you are on this red ribbon, high cost if you are outside. And that's exactly what I was talking about earlier. Um, you want a function like this one that tells you low cost if, you, if it's something that looks reasonable, high cost if it's not. So the thing is, we don't know how to characterize this function, so we're gonna have to learn it. Right? So adversarial training is, you have two functions you learn, one that predicts, and one that tells, you, tells the system whether the predictions are good or not. And basically it works like this. Um, you start, um, so you have an initial segment of a video, for example, if you do video prediction, the, the data tells you here is how the video ends, and uh, you train this contrast function called a discriminator, or sometimes a critic, actually, uh, to produce a low output for things that actually occur in the world. Okay, so those are the, the, the blue points. So we make the, this function take a low value for things that actually occur, and then you give the, this past to the generator, you have it generate a prediction, which initially sucks, and so you feed it to the discriminator and tell the discriminator, produce a large output here to make the output here. So these are the green points, make that large. And so next time around, the value here of the, the discriminator will produce for those predictions is gonna be higher. But here is what you do simultaneously. Simultaneously, you back propagate gradient through the discriminator to train the generator to produce Ys that make the discriminator produce low outputs. Okay, okay, so basically, the generator gets the information about how to change its parameters so as to change its output so that the green points get closer to the blue points, essentially, to a region that its community gives low energy to, right? So eventually, it looks like this, where the, the, the green points kind of match the, the blue points, more or less, in, in distribution, if you're lucky, because those things are kind of finicky, um, and it works. So, you know, you can train those things with uh, past uh, frames or you can just train it on images to just generate images from random vectors. So this thing has a, access to a, a source of random vectors. And if you train this, this thing on images of bedrooms, you get, you know, those are non-existing generated bedrooms. And they all look kind of reasonable except maybe for this guy. It looks like a Austin Powers kind of bedroom or whatever. But, um, you know, they all have a bed and windows and dressers and lights and stuff like that. And those are basically a bunch of random numbers coming into a convolutional net that has been trained to produce uh, bedroom images. And they don't look like anything in the training set. They're different from any training set image. Um, so there are various versions of those GANs. There is a whole menagerie of different types of GANs nowadays. There is psycho GANs and info GANs and W GANs and IW GANs and, you know, like an infinite number of GANs. There is another family of, of uh, generative models of this type called variational autoencoders. Uh, this is when trained on ImageNet. So this is uh, something called energy-based GAN trained on ImageNet. And it doesn't actually produce objects, but it produces things that from far away kind of look like objects, a little abstract. Uh, this is trained on dogs. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Um, I mean, people do much better than this now, but it's still funny. <laughs> Okay, so here's an example for video prediction. So here it's a, a convolutional net that looks at four frames and predicts two frames, two future frames. 
and it looks at uh, images at multiple scales and you know does all kinds of, it's pretty complicated architecture and this is the, pred the prediction you get if you train with least square so you train this video predictor with least square you get blurry predictions if you train it with this adversarial training uh, criteria combined with uh, some others you get you get this kind of prediction considerably sharper so the first four frames are observed the last two frames are you know, so indicated in red here are predicted. And so you get, you know, the, the motions basically continue and they seem fairly reasonable. There's a little bit of blurriness, but it's, it's not too bad. Um, this is when trained on video segments from apartments in New York. So the, the camera kind of rotates and the system has to basically invent what the room looks like as the camera rotates. So here is a, you know, a bookcase and this part of the bookcase, so this is observed. Now it's predicted this part of the bookcase is invented. So it figures out that you know, a bookcase has to continue. It figures out that a couch has to continue. So you know, it, it's captured some regularity of what an apartment in New York is supposed to look like. Um, something that may be slightly more interesting for people interested in sort of in cars, this is data set called uh, Cityscape. And oops. And this is a system where you take a, a video sequence and you run a se semantic segmentation uh, system on the video sequence. And so what you get is a bunch of maps which give you the, the pixels that are labeled for every category, for you know, every pixel. Um, so maps like this, you know, blue is car, uh, sidewalk is pink, and uh, you know, pedestrian <coughs> is red, and things like that. And what the thing predicts is that, so it predicts, uh, in this case here, half a second in the future, it predicts that you know, pedestrians keep crossing the street, the car that is turning left keeps turning left, uh, the scenery keeps kind of moving. You know. So it's kind of useful if you want to work on self-driving cars to have the ability to predict what's going to happen ahead before it, uh, before it happens. It might allow you to use this to train, a, for example, a reinforcement learning system without actually crashing, but just by predicting you're going to crash. Here's a, a new model, more recent one, just submitted actually, called uh, Error Encoding Network. Uh, so this one, in fact, the, the one that actually works is slightly different from this, but um, this is kind of a simpler version to explain. So this one basically trains a model, so it looks at the past, it runs through a few layers of a neural net, it produces an internal state, and ignore the top for the, for the time being, then runs through a generator, essentially another part of a neural net that produces a prediction say a video, you know, another frame in the, in the video. Uh, and you train this using uh, least square or something like this, right? Um, uh, with what is actually observed. And then you play a trick. What you do is you take the difference between those two. So this is a vector, the vector of the difference between those two, the, the, the target and the prediction. You feed this to a parameterized trainable function. And then you feed that, the output of that function to the hidden layer. You add it to the hidden layer. And you train this guy so that this variable is going to take the value that minimizes the prediction error, right? But this variable only depends on the prediction error. And so basically this part of the network, when this value is set to zero, predicts whatever is predictable. And this guy basically parameterizes whatever is not predictable, which is a residual error, and figures out how to represent a hidden latent variable that will actually correct that mistake. So that might represent the for example, you observe someone playing a game and moving something on the screen. Uh, you know, the physics of how things move on the screen is essentially predictable. That's you know, Newtonian physics. But uh, the action that the player uses maybe isn't. And so that would essentially represent the action that the player played, which that would be very useful for things like imitation learning, for example. Here's an example of how this can be used. Um, uh, and I'm probably going to end here. So, uh, you have to wait a little bit. So this is a data set that was produced by Sergey Levin uh, and Chelsea Finn and a few other people at Berkeley. So there is an object, there is a robot arm, and the robot randomly pokes the object. And so the result is that after being poked, the object has moved a little bit. And these are predictions for uh, how the object could have been moved by the, by the thing. This is pure pixel prediction, right? pixel space prediction. So the, system has no notion of object or anything. This is, these are predictions it makes, and each different prediction is generated by a different sampling of the z variable, the latent variable, or the action variable. And that, you can think of this as basically an encoding of what the 
robot arm did without actually having to observe what it did. So that's a sort of action inference, if you want. Okay, I've spoken for long enough, so I'm gonna stop here and uh, take your question. Thank you very much. Scramble the pixels. Yeah, scramble the pixels. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's combinatorial huge. Yeah, that's right. So if you do a fixed scramble and you use a convolutional net, the convolutional net will have a hard time figuring out the thing because it's based on the idea that neighboring pixels are correlated and, you know, kind of a local patch of pixels can be represented efficiently by a list of features. So, um, so it probably would have a very hard time. Now, it turns out there's a paper by Pascal Vincent and Yosha Bengio from way back where they show that if you just, if you take a collection of images you, that you've perturbed through a fixed permutation of the pixels, you can actually recover the topology by figuring out the local correlations between pixels. So, so in principle, it's, it would be possible to make this work if you, you know, hardwired this in. Thank you for giving the talk today. Uh, I'm a big fan to you, actually. Great. You are a rock Thank star you. to me. <laughs> and uh, uh, recently, uh, you know, the D-Wave system and the quantum computer is actually deployed in practice right now. And uh, how would you, like, how would you envision the quantum computing affect the uh, deep neural networks in general? Yeah, is it? Yeah, so the, if you didn't hear, the question is about whether quantum computing will affect uh, deep learning in some way. It's not entirely clear to me. So D-Wave is not actually deployed in practice. It's, it's uh, you know, experimented with by people, and there are a few attempts. Uh, but it's not actually used in practice for like commercial deployment, if that's the question. Um, so the, the D-Wave system is, is not a, a, a full quantum computer in the sense that it, it, it uses quantum tunneling for more efficient function optimization. It's not entirely clear you need this at all for any of the tasks that I talked about. Uh, so I think it's still up in the air whether quantum computing will have any effect. Um, it's possible you could do nearest neighbor much faster with quantum computing. It's not even clear to me that you can, but it's possible. So it's unclear. So I actually have two questions. Uh, the first question is that um, what do you think are solutions to train the algorithm if the data pool is very small, like uh, in the area of healthcare, but only have this some um, solid, maybe an uh, X-ray imaging, or even you know, even that. Like, it was small pool. Uh, so I read I read something about the uh, uh, like the zero shot, one shot, and the uh, uh, zero. So, uh, what do you think of the solution? And the second question is, uh, earlier, the AI lab, like the Facebook developed the chat robot, and they developed their own language to chat. All right. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, let me answer the first question first. So, uh, the, 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 the sort of small data regime, there's basically currently two ways to handle it. One is uh, through transfer learning. So for example, you want to do image recognition, and you want to do, I don't know, medical imaging or something like this, um, and you don't have enough data. So one approach is you, you, you train your neural net on a big data set that you actually have, either with the same type of images or even completely different types of images, as long as the, the statistics are similar, like ImageNet, for example. You know, it's not the same type of image, but it's okay, you turn them black and white, maybe. Um, and then you do transfer learning, so you take the pre-trained machine and then you, you know, retrain this machine for your data. Perhaps you just retrain the top two or three layers. 
uh, to limit the number of parameters. That works really well. So there's actually a service within Facebook that uses this for the, the product division within Facebook. Um, so to give you an idea, uh, uh, there's 2.1 billion users on Facebook, and the uh, Facebook users upload on the order of 1.5 billion photos every day. So there's 1.5 billion per day. Every single one of those photos goes through uh, four convolutional nets that we know about. It goes through way more, but there's, there's four pre-trained convolutional nets. So one that basically recognizes tags uh, of various types on the image, so recognizes objects, it recognizes the type of images. Is, it, is this a birthday or a wedding or landscape or indoor scene or macro photo or whatever. Um, it, uh, uh, there's a second one that, uh, and, and this is used for feed ranking basically, to, to decide whether to show particular images to particular people who have particular interests. Uh, the second one uh, uh, filters objectionable content, so basically uh, violence, pornography, things like that. The third one uh, generates captions for images for the visually impaired. So that if you're if you're blind and you're on Facebook, you, you can get an idea of what's in the picture by, you know, getting this uh, this text description. And then the last one, which is uh, turned on in the U.S. but not in other countries, uh, not in many other countries, not turned on in Europe, is uh, does face detection. So it tags your friends automatically. Um, so that was that was for the first question. <laughs> um, now there's a second answer to the first question, and the second answer to the first question is. Um, you can use unsupervised uh, training or pre-training. So basically, you don't just train the system to classify your medical images into cancer or non-cancer, but you also train it to reconstruct itself. And that has a regularization effect. And so there are situations, certain types of architectures, things called ladder networks or what, you know, stack wetware autoencoders or UNET, where this type of learning actually helps supervised learning and reduces the need for labeled data. Okay, so that, that, that was, you know, ultimately I think unsupervised learning is going to solve all those problems. Um, now, the, your second question was about those bots that, uh, you know, there, were, there was a big story in the press a few months ago that said that, you know, researchers at Facebook had created two bots uh, that were supposed to talk to each other in English and uh, they're supposed to kind of cooperate to solve a task, right? It's kind of a re reinforcement learning type task. And, um, and they ended up using the English language in ways that were not really initially predicted. They would, you know, they would use kind of a funny way to use words to kind of express the, to communicate with each other. And so, you know, some of the newspapers right after Elon Musk, you know, said, uh, you know, AI is going to kill us all. Uh, some, some tabloid uh, published an article saying, uh, oh my God, you know, Facebook uh, researchers, you know, had this uh, project where two bots invented their own language and they had to like unplug the computer in panic mode because <laughs> you know, they were gonna take over the world or something. And it's completely insane because you know, there was a blog post about it and a paper that was published and it's you know, basically, these people are interested in natural language understanding and they trained those systems to use English and they ended up not using English in the way you, you, know, you would normally use it. So they say, you know, the experiment failed. Let's, let's try something else, right? It's not like, you know, they, in, you know, it's not like Hollywood sci-fi movie when you see these guys like, you know, grabbing the, the electronic cars and there's, you know, sparks flying and all that stuff, right? Nothing like that. But it's really funny how, funny in a way, and kind of depressing a little bit of how the, the you know, some of the press describes those things. There was a lot of articles in more serious press afterward that said that's complete bunk, which is good. Hi, uh, I have uh, a comment here. here. Hi. I have a comment and a, a question. The first comment is that uh, at earlier you said there's many systems that has billions of uh, parameters that uh, much more than the number of uh, pixels or whatever you're talking about, and samples, then why it's work? I think from a statistic, statistics point of view, it's a central limit theorem <laughs> doing its job. Uh, that's my comment. Which uh, theory? Central limit theorem, oh, central large limit number theory. theorem, I think. But okay. Hmm. Uh, the, my second question uh, is actually related to this. Uh, are there are all these uh, your uh, examples and uh, kind of works? Are there any theoretical uh, scientists, uh, computer scientists, working on foundation of these kind of things? What makes it converge and what's not? Yeah, uh, I mean, there's a lot of different types of people working on those questions. Uh, some of whom are computer scientists, but many of whom are either physicists or mathematicians. So I've been, uh, you know, I've been involved in a, 
uh, effort for many years to try to get the applied math and pure math community interested in those questions. And I've only been successful in the last year or two. Uh, same for the physicist. So basically there is uh, results in uh, random matrix theory that can be applied to the understanding of the landscape of objective functions of, uh, of those, those networks. Uh, and they, they would seem to demonstrate, to show that uh, the number of saddle points in those loss functions is you know, combinatorially large. And, uh, uh, but on the other hand, that there are, although there might be lots of local minima, they are all pretty much at the same energy level. So it doesn't matter which one you find. And then there is empirical evidence to the fact that uh, the local minima are extremely degenerate. So uh, if you move in a large number of dimensions around those local minima, the, the objective function is, is essentially flat. Uh, and there's a, a small number of directions where it's not flat. That depends on the complexity of the problem. And there is uh, also empirical evidence that uh, Yosha Benjo um, uh, showed in a, in a paper, which is that if you take two uh, solutions. So you, you start from two random initial conditions, you train your neural net, you get two different solutions, then you, you go in straight line between the two, and you barely go up. And if you bend the path just a little bit, then you can go from one minimum to the other without going up. So that tends to show that, you know, there's basically only one minimum. It's actually, it's very degenerate and it's connected everywhere. The intuition that we have, of a lo you know, the usual intuition of a local minimum in one dimension is completely wrong. Uh, you know, building a box, in a hundred million dimension, it's very hard because you need a lot of walls. And so there's always going to be directions where you can escape. And that creates, that creates uh, several points. So that's one, one thing. And then there is uh, you know, work on sort of generalization ability, like why, why do those things generalize the way they do, even though they are way over parameterized. There's an interesting paper, uh, one of the co-authors, Ben Recht from Berkeley recently, where they showed that you can take an image net style network, conventional net, you you set the labels to completely random labels, uh, and those neural nets can still learn the training set completely without errors. Like, you know, one million training samples, they will just nail it, 100% correct. Of course, generalization error is, you know, chance. Uh, but what that means is that there is a huge amount of capacity in those networks that they are able to recruit if they, if they need to, but when you train them on things that make sense, they don't overfit that much. They do overfit, but not, Ridiculously. Hi. Hey. Uh, so it, it seems like it's, it's very clear that it's important to have a, a strong, like, predictive model of the world uh, to achieve intelligence. But uh, it also seems like there may be other components to it, things such as uh, creativity or uh, metacognition. So do you have any thoughts on how we might achieve those other parts of intelligence? So metacognition probably is, you know, uh, you know, number 562 in the list of problems we have to solve, you know, that maybe has a thousand items. So um, I'm not sure about that. But uh, creativity, I think those GANs actually exhibit some level of creativity, really. So there, there are people, for example, at Rutgers, uh, one of them is actually now at Facebook, who, who used GANs to generate um, paintings, abstract paintings in particular styles. And they look really nice. So that begs the question of, you know, is there, you know, what really, what does creativity really mean? Uh, we have a couple of projects at Facebook that I can't talk about yet, but uh, soon, uh, that involve also creating kind of, you know, artistic kind of uh, artifacts using those generative models. And they, they kind of look interesting. I mean, the people who actually are in the business of creating uh, artifacts are actually kind of impressed, so, yeah. Hi. <coughs> Uh, I do uh, some particle physics here. I'm an, under, I'm an undergrad, and uh, one of the big problems that we're facing in implementing technologies like this is that the data we have is collected almost from a third person perspective, mm -hmm. where you have access to all the variable information in three dimensions. And um, so it's very hard to take like a first person camera view perspective of an event and try to pick apart what's going on. What are the major computational challenges? What's the difference between taking like a camera view of, of these scenes and dissecting them with a convol convolutional neural net versus you know, somehow finding an effective way of, of analyzing three-dimensional information? Okay, so a number of different answers there. So first of all, uh, th there is quite a lot of interest of, you know, for the use of convolutional nets in the context of high energy physics basically for you know, trajectory filtering, essentially, so filtering events that are interesting. I'm sure that's the kind of stuff you're 
you're thinking of. Uh, I actually gave a talk at CERN uh, maybe a couple of years ago or a year and a half ago and, and met a bunch of people who are working on this and it's kind of really expanding. There's a colleague of mine at NYU called Kyle Cranmer who's been working on this kind of stuff, actually using those GANs. Um, he's come up with good ideas on you know, characterizing trajectories, sort of generative models of trajectories. Uh, so that said, uh, yeah, very often those trajectories are in 3D and you'd like to be able to basically analyze them in 3D. Um, and so you could use those, those 3D conventional net that I was talking about er earlier in the middle of the talk. They, they, they're sort of efficient for this, you know, because most of the voxels in the high energy physics experiments are empty, so you, you'd like to be able to kind of concentrate the computation where things are, are relevant. Uh, that's one thing. The second thing is that there is uh, a new set of ideas that I didn't talk about called uh, graph convolutional nets or spectral networks. So it's basically the idea that um, an image, a normal image, you can think of, as, of an image as a, a function on a grid graph, on a regular grid, right? The, the pixels form a grid. Uh, you can think of it as a graph where each pixel is connected to its nearest neighbors. And that indicates that it's just a reflection of the fact that neighboring pixels are correlated, right? Um, now, imagine now that you have uh, data that comes to you not in kind of a flat grid graph, but in kind of a weird graph, like, uh, you know, like a cylinder or something, like the calorimeter in a, in a uh, you know, high energy physics experiment or, or some other set of sensors uh, that is non-Euclidean. You can actually define convolutions in those spaces and they're basically diagonal operators in the graph Laplacian, where the graph you know, represents the neighborhood relationships. And so people have actually come up with ways to kind of apply convolutional nets to those non-Euclidean uh, domains. In fact, there is gonna, there's gonna be a, a tutorial at NIPS next week on precisely that, that topic, in exactly one week, Monday next week, which I'm a, a co-speaker on, but I'm actually not gonna speak. It's gonna be Joanne Brunat and uh, Xavier Bresson and, um, and uh, Arthur Schlamm. You talked about, um, oh, sorry. Uh, you talked about systems that both uh, learn and reason, and it seems to me like you argued that to get a, a strong AI, you would need to do both of these things. Now, it seems to me like obviously humans do this, but humans in a lot of ways are very dumb. They make a lot of mistakes, and they're very plastic, and they need to learn to reason whereas a lot of AI systems and reinforcement learning systems do something very smart uh, that takes a, a lot of computational power um, and it's very much hard-coded. Do you think we'll see a trend towards dumber and more plastic reasoning systems? So I think most reinforcement, you know, Michael, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think most reinforcement learning systems that, that people are trained today are actually completely reactive. They are very simple in terms, I mean, they have very little actual reasoning. Uh, the, you know, other than you know things like AlphaGo, AlphaGo Zero, where there is the, you know tree exploration in the set of possible futures, and which is used for training. Once it's trained, it actually just plays you know without much tree exploration actually. Um, so there's not a huge amount of reasoning there, uh, and that's that's a, that's a limitation not of reinforcement learning per se, but of the architectures we use for uh, you know for for all of our AI systems. So I think. Um, you know, what we consider, I think, as intelligent behavior involves this ability to predict. In fact, you know, I think the essence of intelligence really is the ability to predict. And so if you have a good model of the world that is accurate for prediction, then you can use it to plan a sequence of actions ahead and perhaps, you know, uh, uh, moderate, you know, uncertainties about it and things like this. So th this, is, um, this is what reasoning really is about, is, you know, predicting in ahead uh, what's going to happen, not necessarily in time, but also sort of simulating, sort of manipulating models. Like when you, you know, when you think in your, in your head, uh, you know, about mathematics or various other things, you know, very often you kind of have mental models that you manipulate. And there are simulators in a way, right? You kind of give them inputs and they change and things like that, right? So uh, that I think is really the essence of, of reasoning and intelligence. Uh, look at the clock, it's 5.30. I'm going to take one last question. And if you have additional questions, we'll probably just uh, briefly uh, to have a lot of discussions or afterwards. Yeah. What, what's, uh, I'm not that familiar with deep learning neural nets, but I'm curious, um, if I wanted to learn an object up to something like affine transformations, um, can I do transfer learning to do that? 
Is there, can you learn a whole group of transformations and then learn an object and then you know, have the object under those transformations? So yes and no. So if you, uh, if you take a, a convolutional net, for example, and you train it on data sets like ImageNet that have lots of different instances of, of the same objects and various views and things like this, it kind of learns the notion of object relatively independently of the viewpoint, but not completely. Um, so you know, it learns to recognize a, a, you know, a dog, whether it's you know, a profile view or a frontal view. But if you take the, the head of the dog upside down, you probably won't be able to recognize it. Um, the same way we have a hard time recognizing people when their face is upside down. Well, not, not ex just, just you know, little rotation, shears, things like that. Right, right. So small rotation shears and scaling, that, that's handled by the, the, the pooling operation in conventional nets. Essentially. Right, but there's nothing, no explicit geometric no, I mean, there's, there's, there's no explicit 3D geometry, and there is no real explicit 2D geometry, except for the fact that wherever, whenever a feature is detected in one location, it's also detected in other locations, and the fact that there is this pooling operations that basically uh, build a little bit of resist, you know, uh, smoothness to, uh, to kind of variations of the location of particular features. So small variations of the position of elementary features due to you know, rotation, shear, and things like this will actually yeah, you're uh, pooling them, and that's why you're getting them, but you're not explicitly right. modeling them. Same thing with the like exactly. Newtonian physics. There's no built-in physics yet, right? Right. There's okay. no, no, no built-in physics. Thank you. Um, uh, the main event, um, I think, is over. And if you have additional questions, you're welcome to briefly discuss with Professor Yang Lankan afterwards. And thanks very much for participating. And let's give Professor Yang Lankan a round of applause. Thank you very much.